Live from the BBC, The Naked Scientists. Hello, welcome to this week's Naked Scientists. Tonight, Biodiesel will be giving you the recipe, how it is that if you start with a tin of chip fat, you can turn it into an environmentally friendly fuel. Also, where does all the plastic go when you chuck something out? What happens when you put it in that recycling bin? Does it get recycled? And if so, what does it get turned into? Also, where does all the plastic go if it ends up in the sea? There's startling new evidence that suggests that actually tons and tons and tons, in fact trillions of tons of plastic are ending up in our oceans in tiny particulate form and it could be poisoning the seas and eventually poisoning us. That's all coming up later this evening. Hello, I'm Chris Smith and also here to present tonight's programme is Dr Katani. Good evening, everybody. Um, we're also going to be bringing you news tonight about a probe to Pluto and how, uh, you know, if you, in the morning you have those little yoghurty drinks in the fridge, I think they're minging, but um, they've developed probiotic drinks for chickens to, uh, to help beat food poisoning. I'll also be talking about how you can make a monkey yawn, and maybe, if I'm allowed to, it is six o'clock in the evening, talking a little bit about sex and death in spiders. Um, if you've got any questions tonight for us, we are here to talk to you. We have our experts in the studio all about plastics, recycling, uh, the environment, Get calling in 08459 25 2000. You can also have a go at our quiz, Science Fact or Science Fiction. And up for grabs tonight is the Encyclopedia Britannica on DVD. How good is that? So it's worth 60 quid, so it's worth a phone call. 08459 25 2000. And, of course, you can email me, chris, at nakedscientist.com. We'll insert any questions you have for us on anything to do with science, technology and medicine throughout tonight's programme. The Naked Scientist podcast, brought to you by thenakedscientist.com. Well, this week, it's very interesting. Um, have you ever wondered why yawns are contagious? You mm. yawn... I oh, couldn't no, resist no, that, I'm you've sorry. Got me, you've got me now. Anyone at home, you're You, you and now. half of East Anglia is now sort of thinking, exactly. oh, I just feel the mouth twitching a little bit All there. All on the podcast, people yawning around the world. <laughs> Yawns are contagious and no one quite knows why. Um, but some scientists in, um, in Stirling, up in Scotland, they haven't found out why yawns are contagious, but they found that monkeys do contagious yawning as well. And this is the first time they found that another sort of primate like us can do contagious yawning. And they studied macaque monkeys and showed them videos of yawning monkeys and found that the macaques started yawning, sort of having a bit of a scratch, I don't know. Um, so it's incredibly fascinating. They don't know why, and they don't know why monkeys have this contagion too. But, um, yeah, monkeys yawn. Would you have believed it? Do any other animals yawn? I know my dog definitely yawns, and I've seen, beat this, my wife's hamster yawning. That's pretty cool. So I think that's definitive evidence. What about our, what about our two guests this evening who are here in the studio with us, David Butler and, and Rebecca Weymouth? What, what do you think about yawning? <laughs> you're, not, you're not yawning yourselves. So that's a good sign. We're three minutes into the we're program. We're speechless because <laughs> we're yawning. Well, my cat definitely used to yawn. Quite a used bit. to yawn that's not encouraging yeah. did you have the final yawn and then sort of <laughs> afraid so yeah <laughs> <laughs> the naked scientist dr chris and dr cat the naked scientists supported by the welcome trust now food poisoning is a nasty thing and in fact here in the uk and approximately proportionally in the same amounts all around the world in the uk 10 million people are locked to a loo seat annually for longer than they'd like to be just because of something that they ate and common culprits are actually bugs that you can pick up from poultry including things like campylobacter and salmonella and uh, now there's a, a new way maybe to tackle this problem and actually prevent you from getting infected with these things in the first place and that's to stop the chickens that give them to you from carrying them there's a researcher over at the university of arkansas called billy hargis and he's doing what the body shop would have us do and that's have probiotics good bacteria in your diet the idea here is that you extract from healthy chickens guts healthy bacteria and you then feed those bacteria in large amounts to young chickens and the healthy bacteria essentially outcompete they stop the pathogenic the nasty bacteria from gaining a toehold and that means that the chickens carry far fewer of these pathogenic bacteria and as a result they're much better when you put them through the processing they're much less likely to actually end up with you getting infected along the way they're not doing all that stuff like you see in the adverts, kind of jumping up and down and going rollerblading. Haven't seen any chickens doing that quite yet, but the guys over in Arkansas haven't patented the, the recipe yet because they're confident they can actually come up with an even better one. But the bugs are just lactobacilli, that's the posh name for them. They're exactly the same bugs as you would get in a pot of Yakult or, or one of the other proprietary brands that are available. Yeah. 
Now, uh, it has been a very big uh, start to the year for the space race. And in fact, we're going to join uh, now uh, Alan Stern from the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder in Colorado, who's actually jo- joined us a couple of weeks ago to talk about a new mission to Pluto. Because last week we, we told you that Pluto has two new moons to add to its uh, combo. It now has three. Uh, those two new moons are very excitingly called S1 and S2 uh, 2005. But I'm sure they'll have a better name coming along. They join Sharon, Pluto's other existing moon. But uh, that part of the solar system does is is quite literally in the dark as far as our knowledge is concerned. And NASA's now come up with a new mission called New Horizons, and it went live in the middle of January. And the idea is to shed some light on that particularly grey area of our knowledge. New Horizons is a NASA uh, planetary mission, a robotic mission, that was just launched on the 19th of January to make the first reconnaissance of Pluto and then hopefully on to Kuiper Belt objects as well. Uh, The mission is the fastest spacecraft ever launched, but because of the great distance, will take about nine and a half years to reach Pluto before going on into the Kuiper Belt. So its arrival will be in the summer of 2015, and when it arrives, it'll be uh, studying the Pluto system with cameras, spectrometers, and other instruments to give us a very good view of what kind of a system this is and how the different bodies are put together, what they're made of, their geology, and uh, to study their atmospheres. And what does this actually add, in addition to obviously some interesting and intriguing findings of Pluto? What will it add to our understanding of that segment of our solar system? Well, I think most importantly, we've discovered in the last decade something that was completely unexpected. And that is that uh, there's a whole new class of object out there, these miniature planets, these so-called ice dwarfs, uh, which vastly outnumber the uh, rocky terrestrial planets, the four gas giants. Instead of uh, four of each of those, we think that there are hundreds of these ice dwarfs. Pluto being the uh, first discovered and probably the best known example. So this is going to give us uh, our first handle on what this very populous, in fact, the most populous class of planetary body in our solar system is all about. And and is it just because they're so far away, they're so difficult to see, even with telescopes like Hubble, that that you need to send a craft there to look at them more closely? Well, that's exactly right. Uh, Pluto, the brightest of this population, is itself uh, 50,000 times fainter than Mars and 100 times smaller on the sky. Even over 75 years, we've only been able to eke out a very small amount of information. Do you think there are any surprises lurking out there? Well, I think the lesson of planetary science is that we'll be uh, quite surprised. Uh, It's an embarrassing but true statement that uh, across the solar system, as we've visited new types of bodies, we've typically found that our expectations way underestimated the richness of nature. So I expect uh, very much to be surprised. That was Dr. Alan Stern from the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado. I was fascinated to know that, that Pluto's moon is called Sharon. I wonder if the next ones they're going to call Tracy and Nicole. It must come from Essex, must it? <laughs> Something like that. That would be great. Anyway, have you got any questions for our experts here? Tonight we have Professor David Butler, who's from Imperial College and soon to be Exeter University, and Rebecca Weymouth, who's from Cambridge and Peterborough Waste Partnership. They're here to talk about recycling, talk about plastics in the environment. Do you recycle? Do you know what's recycling? cycle um do you want to pick up any tips or share what you do get calling in 08459 25 2000 email us chris at naked scientist.com and share what you know and ask us some questions go on now you know that famines are a major problem all around the world there seems to always be some country where people are starving and it's likely to become more and more acute as a problem anna lacy has been down to the darwin lectures which take place every year in cambridge and this year uh, they're about the subject of survival and extreme survival and extreme conditions and uh, this of course fits that bill perfectly and she got talking to Andrew Prentice from the School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in London. Famine is usually defined as a catastrophic shortage of food of such immensity that it's associated with very high mortality levels. But uh, how come so many people actually come through famine and survive? Let's start thinking about how the body manages in metabolic terms. The first thing it needs to know is how fat or thin it is. And so there's a, there's a hormone that tells the brain that acts as the fuel gauge. And when the brain realizes it's very short of food, it starts to save energy and to use up body fat and to protect the other major organs and uh, hence protect survival. And there are very, very clever mechanisms by which that is all orchestrated. And also some very terrible ones, for instance, cannibalism. How come we haven't evolved similar mechanisms for dealing with lack of water, especially as lack of water and lack of food due to drought are often quite highly correlated? That's a very difficult question and one which I haven't thought about before. 
I, I guess one explanation is that humans have been clever enough to dig wells. So even though there may not be enough water for the crops, they are generally able to get enough to drink. If famine has been such a driving force in evolving you know, what we like, what we eat and how we deal with food, how can we need such a range of foods in order to be healthy? Why can't the Atkins diet say be enough? I think we need to separate out survival and optimal growth and development. If you look back in medieval times and, and people who live in small cottages and hit their head on the uh, hit their head on the beams all the time, we realise that people were much smaller. So although you could hang on in there and survive, there's a big difference between that and growing optimally, having optimal brain function, optimal survival. And that's where the quality of diet is really important. While we're on the subject of diets, that kind of thing, obviously obesity as well is becoming a big problem nowadays. Are these adaptations that we've had in the past causing us more problems than just obesity? I think obesity obviously is the obvious one where we've got a complete mismatch between our modern environment and our very ancient metabolism that has been evolved to survive famine. Diabetes is also thought to be a consequence of our evolution against famine because it uh, is associated with the propensity to lay down fat very quickly. So during times of feast we lay down fat and that of course is regulated by insulin and then during times of, of hunger and and famine, we use up that fat again. Do you think our bodies are going to evolve to deal with fat in the same way that we've evolved to deal with famine? I think that's an absolutely intriguing question. It's a difficult one to answer. To some extent, you can argue that evolution has stopped now. We're not trying to have many children, so the fact that it takes a fat woman a lot longer to conceive two children than it takes a thin woman to conceive two children doesn't make much odds. So my feeling is that we won't evolve back again. Certainly food for thought. Anna Lacey talking to one of the speakers at this year's Darwin Lectures, uh, Andrew Prentice from the School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. You are listening to The Naked Scientist. It's Dr Chris and Dr Kat, and we're here with you until 7 o'clock, of course, taking your science questions on anything science. 08459 25 2000 is the phone number, or you can email me chris at nakedscientist.com. Our topic also for discussion this evening is the science of recycling and also the science of cleaner fuels. Later on tonight, we're going to be showing you how to turn a gallon of old chip fat into an environmentally friendly fuel, some biodiesel, so stay tuned for that. Stripping down science. Okay, let's do it. The Naked Scientists. All right, here's a question for you. Do you know what this is? A cellular structure of air bubbles enveloped in a continuous protein matrix with swollen starch particles, fat and sugar crystals dispersed randomly as discrete particles throughout the material. Is it a Malteser? It's not a Malteser, no. It's a cake. We do have a bag of Maltesers. <laughs> I'm going to have one. Well, we were eating them all the way through that little article about famine. <laughs> uh, yeah, it made me feel most decadent now. Exactly. We have Maltesers while the rest of the world starves. Terrible. Um, so we've had a question in from Jim Moser, who is in Houston, Texas. And he says, um, why do eggs make things rise when they're baked? And why does uh, yeast make dough rise? And the question kind of relates back to that description of a cake, which... Um, when you make a cake, you mix together fat, sugar, flour and eggs. And uh, to make a batter, eggs have a very important property. They mean that they can emulsify things. So we had, uh, was that our kitchen science we had about uh, paint, making an emulsion of paint? We sure did, and someone also wrote in fairly recently and said, what is the science of ouzo? When you take that drink ouzo or raki and you mix it with water and it makes a milky solution, why does it go milky? And the reason is it's exactly the same principle as emulsion paint on the wall. It's an emulsion. So eggs, um, they contain these lipoproteins that can stick fat into a liquid so um, you mix together fat and flour and, uh, and sugar and make a cake batter and then you stick it in the oven and the fat melts and the air that's been beaten into the cake and held in this structure expands to fill in the gaps, make your cake rise. The protein that's in the eggs, in the egg whites, solidifies, holds the whole structure as a stable thing so when it comes out of the oven it doesn't all flop Like a big down. meringue. Like a big meringue and if you've got baking powder in there as well that releases carbon dioxide which is another gas that expands and uh, makes the nice big gaps in your light fluffy cake. So that's why eggs make things rise. They, uh, they kind of make things all stick together and then they hold a structure firm by baking into a solid protein. And the yeast story? The yeast story is, is similar, actually. Yeast are actually a, a type of fungus. Uh, they're a living thing, and when you warm up your 
bread mixture of flour and, and water. They create carbon dioxide again. That creates the holes in your nice fluffy bread. And, and also a bit of alcohol. A little bit yeah. of alcohol. So it makes the loaf bit. taste a tiny bit alcoholic and a little bit kind of nice. That's that kind of taste, yeah. Got a quick question here. This is an email from uh, Gajinda Pal Singh, who's actually in New Delhi in India, and he says he's a computational biologist at the Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology there. He says, Dear Dr Chris, I'm very impressed with your knowledge and curiosity. Thanks. Checks in the post. Um, watching the Discovery Channel, quick plug for the opposition there, um, these two questions came to mind. How does a chameleon change its skin colour so fast, and is there any molecular mechanism uh, that's known to underlie that? Well, actually, it's, it's pretty well known how chameleons change their colour. Lots of people think that they change colour to match in with their surroundings, but it's not actually true. Chameleons change colour to signal to other chameleons what kind of mood they're in. Uh, the usual kind of calm chameleon is a pale, light green colour. So when you see them in Madagascar and Africa, which is actually where they're most common, they're that very calm, pale, light, greenish colour. They're really chilled out. Exactly, uh, quite literally. If you warm them up, uh, in other words, put them into a bad mood, then they can flash red and yellow and, and go all kinds of funny colours. And when they get a bit frisky, they also use colour to attract a mate. But how do they actually do that? Well, it's all down to a very clever system, which is not dissimilar, actually, to the TV screen that you're probably looking at tonight to watch TV, if you've got an LCD screen, for example. In a chameleon's skin, they have these things called chromatophores, and these are tiny cells that are laden with pigment, a colour. And in the normal cell, the pigment is all locked away in these tiny vesicles or pouches inside the cell, absolutely minute. But when a signal comes in from the nervous system or a chemical in the bloodstream, the cell discharges that pigment and it spreads out in the cell and causes the cell to change colour. And depending upon which sets of these chromatophores or coloured cells get discharged, then the, the, the chameleon changes colour accordingly. So the chameleon therefore says, right, I'm in a good mood, I want you to activate the green ones, and so the nervous system turns those ones on. When it's in a bad mood, it activates the red ones and makes the chameleon change colour again. So that's exactly how it does it, Kajinda. <laughs> I think that's absolutely amazing. Nature is a, a fantastic source of stuff. Um, we're now going to have our podcast pick. Every week we have people sending in MP3s uh, a minute and a half long or so. So if you've got some, send them in. People send in uh, science stories. And today we've got one from Science Update, which is run by the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And you can find more at scienceupdate.com. And they're going to talk about viruses, parasites and rock and roll. For the Naked Scientist this week, we'll be looking at why some songs rise to the top of the charts, while others that are just as good languish in obscurity. But first, if you can believe it, we have good news about parasites, in particular those that live in wetlands. In people, parasites aren't exactly a sign of good health, but in an ecosystem, a thriving parasite population can be a very positive symptom. Marine ecologist Kevin Lafferty of the U.S. Geological Survey and his colleagues study parasitic worms called trematodes that live in salt marshes and wetlands. During their life cycles, the trematodes move between many different animals, including fish, birds, and snails. If any one of those host animals disappears from the ecosystem, the parasites will also disappear. And so when we go to a, an ecosystem that has a rich, diverse set of, of animals living in it, we expect to find many different parasites being able to take advantage of that opportunity. Lafferty says this makes parasites an easily accessible window into an ecosystem's health. Next, we'll be updating a topic discussed before on The Naked Scientists, the finding that viruses may be a cause of obesity in some people. The idea is still a bit controversial, but it suggests that in addition to working out and eating well, people can actually help ward off fat by washing their hands. That's right, Chelsea. Besides diet and genetics, scientists have been looking into whether viruses could be a cause of obesity. Recently, a team including nutritional scientist Leah Wiggum of the University of Wisconsin found that chickens infected with human adenovirus AD37 gained a lot more fat than chickens without the virus, and just within a few weeks. This finding brings to three the number of human viruses linked to increased fat, including one that a study found to be more common in obese people. Since there's over 50 human adenoviruses, there's reason to believe that more of them could have the same effect. Wiggum says viruses likely aren't the only cause of obesity, but these findings suggest that a vaccine could someday help stem the growing epidemic. Now, this story should be something of a disappointment to music executives who would love to be able to predict which songs will become big hits. Well, research published in the journal Science shows that you just can't predict hit songs with any certainty. 
The same is true for books, movies, and anything else sold in the fickle cultural market. This song by Shipwreck Union is all but unknown, but a few fans and a lot of luck could send it to the top of the charts. It was among 48 unknown songs posted by Columbia University scientists to eight websites. There, visitors could listen to songs, download them, and see how many times others downloaded them. Sociologist Duncan Watts says they found that different songs became hits on each site, depending on how they did early on. Right, so you see this sort of rich getting richer phenomenon. And that's kind of what's driving uh, this unpredictability. On the other hand, a site without information on how others rated songs didn't have runaway hits at all, showing that social pressure and luck are key ingredients of fame. Oh, I wish I knew that. My band's never going to get to the top of the charts. That was Bob... I should know I've heard it. Oh, Chris, you're so <laughs> horrible to me. That was Bob Hershon and Chelsea Wald from Science Update. You can find more of their podcasts at scienceupdate.com. And we want your podcasts as well. If you've got an interesting science story, uh, turn it into an MP3, about a minute, minute and a half long. Send it in to us. Now, coming up now, we're going to be hopefully talking to our guests about the science of recycling. We have Professor David Butler, Rebecca Weymouth, Peter Barham and Richard Thompson talking about plastic bags, recycling, what's in the environment, what's in the seas. Get phoning in now, 08459 25 2000. Don't leave it to the end of the show. You lot always leave it till right at the end. We can't get you in. Get phoning in now, 08459 25 2000. And, of course, also on the way, we'll be showing you how to make biodiesel. Derek's out there at the moment in the, in the shed, and he's going to be knocking up some environmentally friendly fuel. Clive in Suffolk's called in, and he says he's been running his diesel car on chip fat for a long time. He just buys the chip fat in, in bulk from the supermarket and puts it in his car. Presumably, actually, turns it into biodiesel first, but... He says it runs fine, no problems. Uh, P.S. Um, uh, I'm on my third car. No, he didn't say that. Uh, <laughs> and if you if you have uh, any opinion on biodiesel revolution, give us a call 08459 25 2000 or email me chris at nakedscientist.com. Good evening. It is Dr. Chris and Dr. Cat. We're here as the Naked Scientists, and you can join in our program tonight. We're discussing the science of recycling and the science of the environment. Uh, it's 08459 25 2000, or email me, Chris, at Naked Scientist, to join in. One of our guests this evening is Professor David Butler from Exeter University, and he joins us in the studio now to talk about uh, an invention he's been working on, which is uh, making water available. And water's terribly scarce at the moment, especially here in the south. Wouldn't you agree, David? Is that why you've moved to the southwest? Yeah. <laughs> Originally from Imperial College, yeah. so you saw what was coming. <laughs> well, tell us about your work. Well, I'm very interested in water and reusing water um, because at the moment we do tend to we use a lot of water and we use it and waste it, in my opinion. So we've been looking at ways to try and reuse water where we can. Have you got any figures up your sleeve as to sort of roughly how much water we do use on average, me, cat, yourself, in, in the average day in the average household here in the UK? The average person uses about 150 litres per day. Now, if you imagine 150 litre bottles sat on your table that is an awful lot of water but of that 150 we only drink maybe a liter or so and to put that in perspective if i was someone in africa how much water would i use in a day oh, assuming i don't yeah. live in harare or one of the big centers yeah. assuming i'm a rural african farmer how much water would i be surviving on in 10 a day? liters maybe so therefore we're at least 15 times 1500 percent over how much we actually need to get that's, by in the that's absolutely day. right okay so we have a terrifically wasteful culture what's your solution well my solution is to try and reuse water that we've already used once before and uh, we can take water from our showers and baths and uh, try and up, uh, get it back to a quality that's suitable, let's say, for, for flushing a toilet. Because why do we need to flush our toilets with drinking water? It's always surprised me. Is it just because it would cost the environment so dear in laying in a second set of pipes to deliver slightly less pure water to every house so they could flush their toilets with slightly less pure water? So that's why we don't do it. Yes, and it's very expensive. Some places in the world where they are very short of water do it. But we thought it might be worthwhile looking at whether we could recycle water at the smaller scale rather than the larger scale. 
So what is your solution? <laughs> My solution ba-boom. is ba-boom. <laughs> <laughs> is to try and treat this grey water using a low-tech solution um, to, to plant uh, vegetation, uh, flowers into a gravel bed, maybe on top of a, a large building on a flat roof, and to trickle this grey water, this, treat, this untreated water, this once-used water, and then to use these natural processes to get it back to a suitable quality. OK, that's the, that's the theory of actually what you set up, but how does it actually work if you zoom in at the small scale? What are these plants doing? What is the gravel doing to clean the water? Well, in the gravel, you're getting uh, a build-up of microorganisms that will remove some of the polluting material, and the uh, roots of the flowers will also open up the pores and draw in it oxygen as well. What's, so, sorry, what sort of polluting materials are these? Well, they're, they're oxygen-demanding material that if you, if you put this material, this water, straight into the environment would, would suck the oxygen out of rivers and, uh, and so on. And we, we don't really want to be flushing our loos with that sort of water. So, in other words, it would suck the oxygen out of the environment because it would promote the growth of bacteria. Bacteria, yeah, Because right. it's got phosphates and everything yes. else in it. And, and it's also, also bacterially laden too, isn't it? Yes, and we're, we're actually uh, asking our bacteria to grow in a specific point and we're making a nice environment for, for them to to do that because um my mum does things like putting the washing up water out in the garden well done and i've often wondered about if you could put a, a sort of a plastic tub in the shower to catch some of the water that you don't wash with it, I mean, is that not so good then to to put on the garden well i wouldn't really recommend putting it on your tomatoes for example um when but... someone's peed in the shower <laughs> exactly <laughs> Chris, do you pee in the shower no i was just uh, thinking of people like you i've never peed in the shower in my life you do, you Sorry. Don't, you do other things that i don't know we have professor david butler <laughs> I'm, I'm sure lots of people do actually in hospital you know if people have a problem with passing urine we one of the first things we actually encourage them to do is to try and sit themselves in a warm bath or a warm shower because it is actually quite encouraging it does encourage your nervous system to make you want to have a pee uh, and there's another garden plant that it might benefit <laughs> but uh, how, how does it actually work well there's no problem at all with uh, with water with pee in it um, um that's that's i mean normally speaking uh, unless you've got an infection it's not uh, it's not uh, doesn't have bacteria in it, urine. So that's not really a problem for us. And anyway, the water that we're dealing with uh, would be very, very low in, in um, urine concentration, even if you do pee in the uh, shower. <laughs> so what you would do is then collect the water that comes from a certain set of appliances, the washing machine, the exactly dishwasher, that. the bath yes. water, yes. the shower, yes. and you'd pipe that off separately to your flower bed. To our flower bed on the roof, Trickle it through there. So how do you? You've, so you've got to pump it up. I'm onto, afraid you have to pump it. So that's it. going to consume. That's energy. going to consume energy. Okay. So that's that's the negative side of doing. Why this. is it on the roof? Just to save space. To save space, and then we can use gravity to get it down back into the building. Okay, so it trickles down through the the plants. How much water can can this essentially this flower bed process? This can this can more or less process all the water we need for flushing our toilets, and that is about a third of the total amount of water we we use individually. Does it collect rainwater as well? Yes, that's another option. We can certainly collect rainwater, and rainwater is of better quality, obviously, than this grey water. And we've certainly been looking at techniques for, for recycling that as well. You do need a big tank to collect rainwater if you want a good, secure supply. The water that comes out, is it safe? It's safe for flushing the toilet, and I think it's safe for doing garden irrigation, but I wouldn't, as I say, water my... Uh, tomatoes with it. Is it a special kind of plant that you need to do this or will any no, other plant no. just plant your lawn on the roof? And well run? this is exactly what we're trying. We're trying local species of plants to see how well they do and that's why this system is under development to see you know what plants will, will do what. And what size flower bed do you need to process the output from a standard family? Well more or less we think you need a couple of square metres for each individual. That's not much. No it's not a lot. It's not a lot and um, that's why we think this is a promising technique. What about in winter time, though? Does, when when the whole thing freezes, that's a good can it get question. It shouldn't freeze because grey water will be warm from your showers and baths. But people aren't having showers at three o'clock in the morning when the temperature is lowest. No, but we we collect it in tank in the building <laughs> okay. um, and store it, and it's treated by that time. Okay. But we we are a little bit concerned that some of our flowers die off in the winter, obviously. So we're looking for hardy varieties that will um, grow throughout the season. 
Interestingly, in China, trying to prepare air quality for the Olympics that are coming there, China has air quality that's so bad that on, I think, I think it's over, over 150 days of the year, Beijing has air quality which is uh, unfit for human actually breathing. And they're trying desperately to improve the quality of air in Beijing in time for the Olympics. And so they're implementing a system of rooftop gardens and they have a particularly hardy type of grass which they're now planting on all their high rise in an attempt to, to use that like the lungs of the city and try and suck yes, up some of these yes. particulates. I think these green roofs are very important or very promising uh, from the, the reason you mentioned and also we can use it to treat our, our grey water, our rain water and they are insulating as well. It's David Butler from Exeter. If you'd like to talk to him, uh, 08459 25 2000, or you can email me chris at nakedscientist.com. It's Dr Chris, that's me and Dr Kat. We're here with you until 7 this evening, and we're talking about the science of recycling. We'll be ch- talking shortly to Rebecca Weymouth, who's from Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Waste Partnership. Uh, so where do all those bits of recycled rubbish that you chuck out go? Where do they end up? How actually effective is recycling? Also, the science of plastics and polymers. Peter Barham will be joining us from the Department of Physics at the University of Bristol very shortly. If you have any questions, for him, same phone number. And where does all that plastic go when it goes down the drain? Lots of it, unfortunately, ends up in the sea. And Richard Thompson, who's a marine ecologist from Plymouth University, is going to be discussing the consequences with us very, very shortly. Sorting out the sparks from the quarks, the Naked Scientists. It is the Naked Scientist, Dr Chris and Dr Cat. If you have any questions for us, 08459 25 2000. Here in the studio with us this evening is Rebecca Weymouth. Um, good evening, Rebecca. Thank you for coming along. Recycling. It's something which I've only recently, actually, I have to confess, really started to take seriously enough. Now I know what I know about what's happening to our planet. But what actually is the point of recycling? Does it all add up to, to a benefit to the planet? I mean, it really does. Um, every little helps. People may think, you know, well, they don't have that much rubbish, you know, is it worth me putting my one can in the bin or whatever? And it really is worth recycling um, all the materials that the councils ask you for. It really does make a difference. So what sort of things can actually be recycled? <laughs> Another pun there, Kat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it does depend on where you live. So, you know, do check with your local council. That's the caveat I'm going to say. But the classics are obviously paper, glass, cans, um, your garden waste. Um, and plastics in some areas. What about things like clothes or electrical equipment, computers and, and things that are broken but you know, obviously you don't really want to throw something in the bin? Yep, clothes are obviously another classic. Um, they're more traditionally recycled through um, bring banks so you, know, you can take them to your local supermarket when you go shopping and obviously they go directly um, to benefit charities as well. And electrical equipment, um, there's a, that's a huge market, or it's an exploding market, um, and um, they can mostly be recycled. If you take them to your local CA site and they get taken off the specialist reprocessors, you can bl- break them down, take out all the metals and the plastics and separate them and get them recycled. Rebecca, I've got an email here from Peter Remington, and he says, I never know which plastics can be recycled and which can't. Can you tell me, and how is it all recycled? What's the mechanism of recycling? How, what do people like you actually do? Um, well... Here in Cambridgeshire and Peterborough, um, we accept plastic bottles only for recycling. And that's the guidance we give our, our public because... But all bottles aren't made equal, are they? Some are some materials, some are others. I've are... heard that some recycling programmes are allergic to Coke bottles, for example, because they're, they're sort of polycarbonate, different kind of material oh, than really? others. I don't know if they've changed their recipes now. Well, I don't know. Past, I mean, maybe true. Peter will be able to shed a bit more light on it. But basically, the reason we ask for bottles is because they're made of three different types of plastic, which we know are readily recyclable. And that's uh, called PET, PVC and HDPE. So if you stick to bottles, then the likelihood that you will be cycling those three types of plastic. As some people say, oh, you hear about these stories, people recycle glass or newspaper, and it actually costs more environmentally and in terms of energy to recycle. Um, is, Is this really the case? Um, no, it's not. I mean, I mean, the industry, the paper industry, the can industry, the glass industry, they rely heavily on um, second-hand materials because there's huge en- energy savings from recycling. For instance, recycling aluminium cans, it saves 95% of the energy it would take to use primary resources. There's huge economic and environmental savings from recycling materials. Becca, I've got an email here from uh, Eth Mountfitchett, who's in Suffolk, and he says, My local council has told us to stop putting plastic carry bags in the recycling bin. The reason, allegedly, is that some supermarkets are issuing biodegradable bags which can't be recycled. 
sounds rather counterintuitive. It's too expensive and time-consuming to sort these from the ordinary carry bags, they say. It seems to me that these biodegradable bags are actually causing more rubbish as no bags at all are now being recycled. Are there any other schemes that have similarly backfired and what can be done to resolve the situation? Well, that's an interesting one because um, I'm surprised um, that he's been told that because... um, All supermarkets usually have recycling schemes now, so you should be able to take your plastic bags back to the supermarkets to get them recycled, regardless of whether they're degradable, biodegradable, whatever else, you know, they've got written on them, so that shouldn't matter. I mean, but the best thing to do in the first place is obviously not to use um, plastic bags or take them back and reuse them so you don't get this build-up of plastic bags in your kitchen drawer or buy bags for life or get cotton shopping bags instead. The figure I heard stated was that about a trillion plastic bags get used all around the world every single year. That's Rebecca Weymouth from Cambridge and Peterborough Waste Partnership. If you want to ask her a question, 08459 25 2000. It's Dr Chris, that's me and Dr Kat here with you until 7 on The Naked Scientist. Uh, very, very shortly we'll be talking to Peter Barham who's from the Department of Physics at the University of Bristol and uh, also giving you the recipe for biodiesel. Laying the facts bare... Ooh. The Naked Scientists. Joining us now from Bristol to tell us about the science of plastics, Peter Barham, good evening. Good evening. Now, Peter, what actually is a plastic? What is a polymer? Polymer is a long molecule, basically lots of different atoms joined together to make a string, usually mostly carbon. Um, But basically it's very, very, very many thousands, sometimes millions of individual molecules, atoms rather, joined to make one long string. And how do you get different types of plastic? So you get, you know, very hard plastics in bottles and then flimsy plastics in bags. Depends on what you stick on the side of the chain. Um, You can have different atoms on the sides of your polymer chain. Some make things like polyethylene, which is really floppy plastic sort of stuff you're used to in plastic bags. Others make the rigid plastics, like the PET that's in bottles. Now, what actually is a biodegradable plastic, though, Peter? When we say this is something that breaks down, is it true to say this could be in the ground for 100,000 years and therefore we should use a biodegradable plastic? What's the difference between the two and how they work? Well, a lot of this is definition. Um, To be very careful, strictly speaking... A biodegradable plastic is one which will degrade, that's disappear back to carbon dioxide and water if left in the atmosphere on its own, whereas other plastics won't. Now, that could mean something like polythene actually is biodegradable. Bury it in the ground, it will disappear in about 100,000 years or so. <laughs> One thing I have noticed, actually, Peter, is um, in the old days, plastic bags from, from supermarkets were actually quite reliable. You could put things in them and keep them for a very long time and they wouldn't go off, if you like. But then recently I noticed that when I started to put bags in the boot of my car and carry things around in the boot of my car, being as it is almost like a mobile cesspit, uh, <laughs> that the, the ultraviolet light in the sun are coming through the window seem to, or the sunlight seems to have broken the bags down. They go into these tiny little pieces of shrapnel. Is that true? Well, I don't know what, what you do for what you've got in the back of your car. Um, but but are plas- plastic bags degraded by ultraviolet? They are, aren't they? All plastics can... Some, most plastics can be degraded by ultraviolet, but I'm surprised that much ultraviolet will get through the, cars, the windows of your car in the first place. Um, it's more likely there's something else in the back of your car, I think, <laughs> <laughs> that's doing that. Maybe it's Chris's feet. I mean, what, what should we do about the huge number of, of plastic bags? Is there any solution to the plastics that we're putting in the environment? The problem with plastic bags and all plastics is that recycling is not really a very good option. The trouble is there are so many different plastics, unless you know exactly what it is you're recycling, you can't do much with it. So, say, plastic bottles that Beck was talking about earlier on, there are only a few different types of plastic bottles. If they say PET on the bottom of them, you know what they are, and then you can turn them into something else, like um, fibre or something like that, possibly, to make um, fibre fill for soft toys or duvets. Um, but if you take plastic bags, there's a vast range of different things used to make them. There's PVC, there's polyethylene, there's polypropylene, a mixed up those would just make an awful mess and be co- totally impossible to recycle. So how are we actually getting around the problem and now making recyclable bags? What's being done to do that? How do they work? Uh, basically, any bag would be recyclable if you knew exactly what was in it. The only way you can make that work is if you are a supermarket or a company that makes bags, that you take the bags back, that you give out, then you know their provenance, you know exactly what was in them, and then you could send them to be recycled. But as soon as you get just one or two foreign bags in there from something else, if you most of them are, say, polyethylene or polythene, as people normally call it, and a few are PVC, you try and mix them together, and the whole thing will r- completely ruin your machine if it's posting on it, and the whole thing won't work. It's a terrible shame. Thank you, Peter. Um, so hang, hang on the line, and uh, we may come back to you very, very shortly.
This is The Naked Scientist, Dr Chris and Dr Katz. So we're talking the science of recycling and the science of the environment, environmentally friendly fuels. On the way, the recipe for biodiesel. And we'll also be talking to Richard Thompson, who is from the University of Plymouth. He's a marine ecologist, and he's going to be telling us what happens when all that plastic ends up in the sea. If you have any questions and you'd like to join in tonight's discussion, 08459 25 2000 is the phone number, or you can email me, chris at nakedscientist.com. Fancy listening to the naked scientists in your bed, <laughs> on your way to work, or even at work? Mm-hmm. Why not subscribe to our podcast? For more information, visit nakedscientist.com forward slash podcast. Dr Chris and Dr Cat here with you through until seven. Joining us now, Richard Thompson from the University of Plymouth. Good evening, Richard. Good evening. Now, it's well known that uh, a hell of a lot of plastic bottles and bags and things get used every single year. The figure that was published a, a few years ago was that over a trillion plastic bags alone a year, and obviously plastics beyond that go, go into the millions and millions and millions of tonnes. A lot of it ends up in the sea. Yeah, it's estimated about a million tonnes of plastic products are, are produced annually. Um, obviously, quite a lot of that material goes into, into landfill, a small quantities recycled, but quite substantial amounts do enter the environment as litter or debris, it's estimated about 8 million items of litter go into the sea every day, and much of that is plastic. And when it gets into the sea, what does it do? Just bob around, or does it actually break down? Much of it is found floating at the surface. The majority of plastics are buoyant or neutrally buoyant, so we find them on the surface floating. We find them distributed on strand lines where they're washed up on shores throughout the world, really, all the way from the poles through to the equator. We also find lots of plastic on, on the deep seabed now as well because as plastics, as they, as they stay in the sea, they become fouled by marine organisms and this alters the, the overall density of the plastic object so that uh, plastics that floated when they, were, they first entered the sea can become negatively buoyant and sink to the seabed. You mentioned marine organisms. Are, are there things in the sea that actually eat plastic then? Quite a lot of organisms will eat plastic. Usually what happens is it seems that creatures mistake plastic for what they might normally eat. So to a turtle, for instance, a floating plastic back carrier bag might look quite similar to the jellyfish that it would normally eat. To a seabird, small coloured fragments of plastic on the shoreline might well be confused for the food items that those, those birds would normally be eating. And it's, it's a big problem with not only the actual environment of the sea, but animals as well. I remember seeing some terrible footage, I think, of birds with the, the rings from the top of beer cans stuck round their necks. And is, is that a problem as well, sort of physically affecting animals and, and life? There's, there's a range of different problems. Um, there's the physical uh, problems that you've mentioned of entanglement, and that can be for birds, it can, particularly for marine mammals as well, and also for fish, they're actually getting caught up and tangled in various bits of, of plastic debris in the sea. There's also problems if, uh, if creatures do eat plastic that it can lead to suffocation or it can block the digestive tract and it can reduce the, the sensation to, to feed. Now, Richard, one thing that um, the Japanese have been looking at is what actually happens to these tiny particles of uh, plastic when m- marine organisms begin to filter them and eat them. Um, and th- I think that they have a, a theory, in fact it seems perfectly reasonable to me, that these tiny particles of plastic could actually be bioconcentrating, in other words accumulating toxins and then leading those toxins to enter the food chain. That, that is entirely possible. Um, the, the mechanism that's been shown in, in the work in Japan is that uh, plastics, when they're floating at the sea surface, uh, will be very attractive to hydrophobic contaminants, chemicals that have entered um, the marine environment from other sources, things like PCBs and DDE, are hydrophobic in nature, and they'll latch on to the surface of, of buoyant objects rather than be in the seawater. And so floating plastic debris can accumulate some of these contaminants to several orders of magnitude more concentrated than those chemicals were in the surrounding seawater. So they're sort of mopping up contaminants. And, of course, the question is, if you've got something that's concentrated contaminants, is there any danger of that that contaminant coming off, perhaps in a different different circumstance, maybe in the guts of an organism? Are you worried? I'm concerned about it, and it's certainly something that we're working on uh, at the moment here at the University of Plymouth. Richard, thank you very much. That's Richard Thompson from the University of Plymouth. It's Dr Chris and Dr Cat. We're here with you until seven discussing tonight the science of recycling and the science of environmentally friendly fuels. And with that, let me introduce you uh, to Derek, who is out with Dan Tomlinson and Mark Nielsen in the garden shed in Cambridgeshire, finding out how to turn that gallon of old chip fat from the, from the chippy or the kebab van even into some biodiesel.
Now then, here on the Kitchen Science feature on The Naked Scientist, we often go around schools or maybe somebody's kitchen just to find out what you can do in your kitchen. But here we have some ultimate kitchen scientists who have actually taken kitchen science to the extreme and we're here at the home of one of them, Daniel Tomlinson, who's going to tell us what he's been doing. So, Daniel, what is it you do here? I make biodiesel from used cooking oil, which I can then run my car on. OK, and I can set the scene. We're actually here in Dan's garden, basically, and right next to us is his shed, and we're actually hoping to do this recording in his shed, but it's a little bit cramped, you know, for that, and it's, it's got a, a big disused boiler, it's got about two dozen cooking oil vats, it's an amazing place, and we will be hearing all about how it works. But also with us is Mark Nielsen, um, and he's going to be telling us a bit later on exactly how this operation is being scaled up. But, Mark, could you tell us firstly, biodiesel, what's the idea behind it? Biodiesel is uh, basically a fuel made from vegetable oils and fats, and we can use that in any diesel engine without modifications. And so how environmentally friendly is it? Basically, biodiesel is carbon neutral. What we're doing, we're taking uh, a fuel, burning it, and then the carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere. The carbon dioxide is then uh, absorbed by the plants, plants grow, and the resulting seeds are crushed, and the oil comes out of that, and we use that oil to make biodiesel. Cool. OK, then we'll be hearing more about your big operation soon. But, Dan, firstly, here we are then, next to your shed. So please could you explain how all of this equipment works? Firstly, this kind of big boiler that you've got that's about two feet by three feet suspended on this kind of wooden scaffold. Um, what's that for? That is uh, the main processor, which I mix oil and methanol together. It causes a reaction called transesterification. There needs to be a catalyst as well, for which I use caustic soda. OK, and let's just talk... You said transesterification there, did yeah. you? OK, so, I mean, what is that doing, essentially? It's separating glycerin out of the um, vegetable oils and replacing it with methanol. So you go from a glycerin ester to a methanol ester. OK, and is that what diesel is, essentially, that people do put in their cars? Um, no, not exactly. That's a completely different thing, really, but... The methanol esters are quite uh, low viscosity and they have burning characteristics similar to petroleum-based diesel, so it's a fine substitute for diesel in a normal diesel engine. OK, so, yeah, they're, they're kind of quite thin, they're not too thick and so on, that's great. Yeah. OK, then, so take me quickly through the process then. You, you pour oil into your boiler and then, and then what happens then? Well, I pre-filter it first because I use used oil from kebab shops, which... Uh, means I need to remove bits of chips and things like that um, to stop it blocking my pump. <laughs> uh, do you reuse the chip bits too? <laughs> no, uh, no, no, no. They go on the compost, actually, so or in the green bin. So. No, that is highly environmentally yeah. friendly. OK, <laughs> and, and then what? And then, basically, I put about 60 to 80 litres of vegetable oil into the tank and then mix up about 20 litres of methanol with a f couple of hundred grams of caustic soda and then put it all together heat it to about 50 degrees and mix for a couple of hours and that causes the reaction to take place and then it's the glycerin is actually at that point separated from the oil okay and then how do you how do you purify it and get it out just settling basically at that point i empty it out of the tank and into various smaller tanks that sit at the back of the shed for a couple of days and um, when i come back there's a thick brown layer at the bottom that's kind of solidified glycerin and at the top is uh, the thin, golden biodiesel, ready, nearly ready to go in the car. Fantastic. OK, then. And you said you use kebab oil. I mean, give me an idea. Can you use any sort of oil? Yeah. I mean, my girlfriend's Spanish, and we eat a lot of chorizo. And the chorizo oil that we get from frying up the chorizo also goes into the mix as well. I mean, it can be <laughs> animal fats or anything, really. So really, any old oil that you come across, you're basically whacking in your biodiesel processor? Yeah, basically. <laughs> OK, fair enough. So that sounds absolutely brilliant. Now, of course, other people might be interested in, in, in getting hold of biodiesel, and so we, of course, know a man who's supplying it on a larger scale. So this is Mark Nielsen, of course, who we heard from earlier. So, Mark, what is it exactly you're, you're doing or about to do? Right, well, I'm getting uh, a large bulk order in for some biodiesel, and the aim is to supply biodiesel to the local area, local Cambridge area. People will be able to bring their vehicles up to our outlet, and we'll be able to pump biodiesel into their cars. And really, I mean, if someone's got a diesel car, can they expect just to put this stuff in there and, you know, will it work fine? Yeah, the other, I mean, any biodiesel needs to be blended at winter time because it does gel at lower temperatures and that'll ensure that the f fuel will flow through the, the vehicle's uh, fuel system. 
OK, but of course, we're hopefully uh, coming through this cold winter period, so with some warm weather ahead, it, it could be quite a viable option. It definitely could. I think what with the uh, higher price of normal petroleum fuel, biodiesel will certainly take off. And if we can get uh, local farmers involved, we could set up a large-scale uh, commercial biodiesel plant for the Cambridge area. OK, then, so if anyone wants to know about this biodiesel operation, how can they find out about it? Well, um, if you wanted to find out, Cambridge Biodiesel's on the, on the internet, and people can contact us through our website. It's uh, cambridgebiodiesel.co.uk. OK, then, so, well, thank you very much to Dan Tomlinson and Mark Nielsen for showing me uh, all the different aspects of the biodiesel setup, and for Dan, of course, showing me his shed as well. I am in awe of them, basically, because they are the ultimate kitchen scientists, so um, please do remember them and uh, think of them when you're filling up your car with diesel next time. OK, then, thank you very much for having us, guys, and uh, good luck with your various operations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. So Naked Scientists, Dr Chris and Dr Cat, we're here with you until 7 this evening talking about the science of the environment. Thank you very much to Derek, who was there with Dan Tomlinson and Mark Nielsen in their garden shed. Stripping down science. OK, let's do it. The Naked Scientists. The Naked Scientists, we're into the last ten minutes. We are bound towards seven o'clock. And if you have a question for us on anything to do with the science of the environment, Dr Chris and Dr Cat, that's us. We're waiting with bated breath to take them. 08459 25 2000 or email chris at nakedscientist.com. I noticed that Brian in Somersham has called in to say a carrier bag uh, started to biodegrade in his car too. So it's not just me. <laughs> uh, and, Your freaky uh, car. We've got Anne in Angus Green as well. Says that, why don't we just recycle the Mille- Millennium Dome? It's just sitting there. Good point, Anne. It's a good thought. Um, I think actually it might... They, isn't it a telecoms company have got some plans? They do it? functions in there as well. I think they have homeless people in there at Christmas. I had a call from Iris, who's in Wanford, and she says, what happens to syringes? How do they get recycled? Well, actually, Iris, they don't anymore. Historically, we did reuse syringes, and those are the ones that were made of glass, but these days it's much cheaper to make them out of plastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then they end up on the beach, of course, and, um, and Richard Thompson picks them up in his uh, marine ecology studies. Right, let's have a quick chat to Jim, who's in Ipswich. Hello, Jim. Hiya. Welcome to the Naked Scientists. What would you like to know about? Right, just uh, see if we can work this one out. Uh, we reckon that the polar caps or the ice caps are melting. Yeah. So if we assume, let, can we work it as MD works out that if we assume they've all melted mm. and, and the water levels have all risen, yeah. uh, there's a good old Suffolk word for you, Riz, yeah? Mm. Uh, how much land would be left? And because of like, places like Australia, India, all the inland bits, would there be enough land for us to survive on? And would the water be diluted enough? Well, if you wanted to define if there's enough land, you could give everyone a metre squared in the world population of the Isle of Wight at the moment, if right. everyone was packed onto the Isle of Wight, but that's not really survivable, is it? No. Um, in terms of actually the poles melting, people say it's really bad news if the poles melt, but actually it's not, because if the North Pole disappeared tomorrow, there wouldn't uh-huh. be any change in sea level. Right, this and the this reason for that enough. is because it's entirely made of ice, and that ice is floating. And so, as you know, oh. the ice is made of water, and it weighs the same as water, and the amount of water level change is proportional to uh, the displacement. So, actually, if the North Pole melted, we wouldn't be in such trouble. The real worry is ice on land, and that's Greenland and the South Pole, parts of Antarctica. That's a real worry. If that melts, we are in trouble. Uh, uh, Predicted sea rise levels for the next 100 to 200 years or so are anything from a few centimetres, maybe to as much as, literally, over the next 1,500 years, seven metres. I don't think it'll come to that, but uh, it's not just the melting of the water. If the planet warms up, as you know, when things get warmer, they expand. And so just the getting warmer effect is enough to cause the oceans to expand a bit and to increase in depth and height. And in fact, Greenland alone, the melting of the ice on Greenland is contributing to about a 0.5 centimetre rise in ocean levels everywhere every year. How close is your house to the sea, Jim? <laughs> Jim, how's your insurance? <laughs> oh, pretty all right, pretty all right. I'm in Felix Stowe. <laughs> no, well, you, you could be uh, Felix Stowe on sea, yeah, even, well, at sea, I'm pretty soon. Really so I'm not going to worry too much. <laughs> Quick go at the quiz, Jim. Yeah, go on in. The study of insects is called entomology. Is that science fact or science fiction? Fact. Absolutely right. The scientists are entomologists. Absolute zero is minus 273 Kelvin. Is that fact or fiction? <sighs> Fiction. You're right. Absolutely, uh, absolutely zero is minus 273 Celsius. Well done. Thanks very much for your call, Jim. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Colin is in Peterborough. Good evening, Colin. Hello, Colin. I think we've lost Colin. Um, now, 
I've got a couple of emails here. This one is from Olivia Orr, who uh, she says, Where did the naked bit come from? Do you sit in the studio being proper hardcore nudists? <laughs> Seriously, what's with the naked? Please reply ASAP. Actually, Olivia, if you dial up the webcam, uh, if you go to BBC Radio Cambridge's website and go to webcam 1B, you can see us here sitting in the studio. I'll give you a wave. Hello. I'm naked. Uh, and you can see for yourself. <laughs> Feast, I'm feast your eyes on that. Right, uh, we have got from Roger, originally from Camberley, Surrey. He's driving around through the area. He says he's heard that only two major recycling plants are in the UK and the rest goes in boats to abroad. Uh, if this is the case, doesn't the pollution from this offset the benefit of recycling? Um, do you know anything about that, Rebecca? Is, is that true? Um, I don't think that's true. I know that there is a, a number of plants up and down the country. I mean, it's a, there's a sort of staged process. You get reprocessing plants and mills. I mean, the UK paper industry is big on its own. I mean, you know, it's thriving on its own right. It doesn't need to import all paper from outside or wood from outside. And often that um, there is an um, amount of recycled material that is exported. For instance, green glass is an example because we just don't have the market for it in this country in terms of the glass production. But the transport costs are offset by the energy saved from recycling it in Europe. So, Let's have another go and see if Colin's there. Hello, Colin. Hello. Yeah, I'm Good evening. <laughs> uh, we're going to have to squeeze you a little tiny bit because we're running short of time. What's your question? Uh, we're in Ireland, surrounded by water. Mm. And how come we got a water shortage? I, th I think that we're going to have to ask David Butler that. David. I guess what you're talking about is a fact, why don't we use seawater to drink? Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah, well, we could. We could. It's perfectly possible from a technical point of view, but it's going to cost us a lot of money and a lot of environmental damage to do it. It uses a huge amount of energy, it doesn't does. it, does. Yes, it does. Just to literally boil water to turn it into That's one way of doing it, boiling water, but very energy-intensive. Yeah, but you got, uh, in America, you've got uh, um, a, a city like Las Vegas in the middle of a desert. Got no water there, so how, now how do they get their water? And we've got water nearby to us. Yeah, they pipe it in over very long distances, which costs a heck of a lot in uh, pumping costs. Colin, we're going to have to move on because we're a little bit short of time. But thank you very much for your call. OK, bye. Got a quick one here from Peter Coleman. He says, why are we encouraged to shred all paperwork, but we're not allowed to put shredded paper in the recycling bin? Do you know about that, Rebecca? Um, well, I believe it's because um, small shreds of paper would clog up the paper reprocessing system. But, I mean, I think it depends on um, your local authority and the paper mill that it goes to. But... Um, of course, you can also compost shredded paper, so that's an alternative. Oh, there you go. Oh, that's exciting. That's a good idea. I have a question here from Anne, who says, Anti-diarrhoea tablets. I've never been in favour of over-the-counter remedies, but recently accepted a friend's offer of some tablets after a problem an hour before an important event, with successful results. How on earth do they work? Right, I've got a minute to answer this. OK, Anne, the answer is that anti-diarrheal tablets like loperamide, or Imodium, that's the trade name, they contain a version of morphine, and they're a morphine-like drug which has some morphine-like effect without actually all of the morphine-like effects, so it doesn't send you to sleep or make you feel high, for example. One side effect of morphine and morphine-like drugs, including heroin, is that it switches off the bowel. In other words, it converts motility, the propulsion through the bowel, into backwards and forwards mixing movements. And that's why people who tend to take a lot of morphine for pain or people who are drug addicts get very, very constipated. So what scientists have been able to do is to find which bit of the morphine molecule works and makes that effect and then make a molecule that mimics that effect, call it loperamide, and put it in a tablet form, which you can take when you have an important event coming up. We just had a quick email from Colin, um, and he says that he made biodiesel for a few years, but found after paying the customs and excise on it, um, it was very different, <laughs> not very different in price to pump fuel, and the mess and time made it uneconomical. But it was fun, though. I'm sure it was probably Derek fun. Derek sounded like so he was having a whale of a time. Maybe, you know, in the future we can try and make some better, larger scale way of uh, doing... I suppose it's possible. That, that's actually quite an important point, though, because we all say, uh, yes, let's, let's grow lots of biodiesel, let's grow lots of environmentally friendly green fuels, but the problem we've got here is that when you actually make those fuels... The cost to the environment of making all the all the reagents we need to do it makes it preclusively expensive. So actually, it doesn't really translate into a net benefit. Right. Well, let me say a very big thank you to everyone who's helped out this evening. I have to say thank you to Professor David Butler from Exeter University with his plants that clean up wastewater. Thank you for coming in, David. To Rebecca Weymouth from uh, Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Waste Partnership. Thank you for telling us all about recycling. Thank you. Also, Peter Barham talked to, uh, to us about the science of polymers, and he was from the University of Bristol. And Richard Thompson from Plymouth University about where all that plastic goes when it ends up in the sea. Next week, we're answering your science questions on anything to do with science, technology and medicine. So give us a call and join us at six next week. Sorting out the sparks from the quarks, the Naked Scientists. For more information, get online at nakedscientists.com.